welcome back. We left um, with the jury in progress in the state of Ohio versus Raymond Tenzi. Uh, we left with the defense presenting its case. So at this time, uh, Mr. Matthews, your next witness. Ray Tenzi. My name is Raymond Tenzing. Last name is spelled T E N S I N G. You live here in Hamilton County? Yes, sir. How long have you lived here? My whole life, 27 years. Are you married or single? I'm single. You say you're 27 years old? Yes, sir. Do you have any children? No, sir. How tall are you, Ray? I'm six foot three. How much do you weigh? About 220 pounds. Were you about that on July 19th of 2015? Yes, sir. Are you, would you call yourself right-handed or left-handed? I'm actually ambidextrous. I do a lot of things with my left hand. I write left-handed. I throw a, a ball left-handed, but I do shoot a gun right-handed. And why do you shoot right-handed? That's my dominant hand for shooting. What kind of educational background do you have? I graduated from Corrine High School uh, in 2008. I have a uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Cincinnati in criminal justice, and I have a, uh, a POTA police certification through the state of Ohio. And when did you become a POTA certified? Uh, 2010. And did you make a decision at some point in your life that you wanted to be a police officer? Yes, sir, at a pretty young age. When did you do that? Uh, my early teens. Um, my dad was a firefighter. He would come home with stories and just pique my interest. And I just, I always had a knack to just, I wanted to serve. I wanted to make a difference. And I thought police work was one of the best ways to do that. And how did you go about getting started? Uh, when I was about 15 years old, I joined the Hamilton County uh, Sheriff's Explorer Program. It's, it's kind of a, uh, a Boy Scout organization for teenagers that are interested in a career in law enforcement. And I did that for five years. We do ride-alongs, uh, we work security and traffic control at festivals, and we do weekly trainings, um, area-based trainings, things of that nature. Did you achieve any rank in the Explorer post? Yes, sir. I just started out as a, just a regular Explorer. I worked my way up through the ranks, eventually uh, becoming a captain. I'm basically in charge of the whole organization. And did that continue after you graduated from high school? Yes, sir. Where, where did you go to college? Uh, actually, my freshman year, I went to um, Ohio State, where I studied criminology. And after my freshman year, I transferred back to University of Cincinnati. And you indicated you got a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice? Yes, sir. And as part of that program at UC, you attended the police academy, correct? Yes, sir. Was that part of the UC program? It is. Actually, at UC Claremont, they have their own um, police academy where you can become certified and also earn credit hours towards your degree. What kind of grades did you get at UC? Uh, I graduated with a 3.7 GPA. On a four-point scale? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what kind of employment history do you uh, shortly after I was certified as a law enforcement officer, I was hired um, on a part-time basis at Green Hills Police Department um, while I was finishing up uh, my college degree. And how long did you work at Green Hills? Uh, just shy of four years. And, and where did that fit in in connection with your, your college? Um, I worked part-time, mostly at night with Green Hills as an officer, and then during the day I would, I would go to school to finish my degree. Shortly after I graduated from UC, I was promoted to full-time status as a police officer with Green Hills. And Green Hills is here in Hamilton County, Ohio, correct? Yes, sir. Up by Wind Woods? Yes, sir. Um, 
And then how long did you work full time for Green Hills? Uh, several years, two or three years, I believe. And what happened after that? Uh, I actually applied to the Ohio State Highway Patrol in the fall of 2013. I was accepted into their State Highway Patrol Academy in Columbus. And you did not complete that, correct? No, sir. Why not? When I went up there to receive the training, it was a six-month academy. Um, I believe during the hiring process there was a good chance I could be stationed back in Cincinnati as a state trooper. And when I got up there, I just more or less had kind of an epiphany that this is not right for me. I didn't want to run the risk of being stationed in Cleveland or Chillicothe for 10 years by myself. I wanted to remain local in Cincinnati. It just this wasn't a fit for me. So you did not complete the Ohio State Police Academy, correct? No, sir. I went back to Green Hills full time. Do you remember how long you worked back at Green Hills? Until I was hired at UC? Yes. Uh, approximately uh, eight to nine months. Then the, your next stop was at the <coughs> University of Cincinnati, correct? Yes, sir. When did you start at UC? Uh, April 14th of 2014. And what was your rank when you started? What, how, how did you get hired at UC? What did you start out doing? Uh, just patrol officer. Were there a number of new officers hired at the time you were? Yes, sir. Was there any reason for that? Uh, there was a large problem with crime in and around UC's campus, and in order to address that crime, uh, UC had authorized to grow their police department to hire more officers to essentially go farther out into the surrounding community to address those crime issues. You were one of the officers hired, correct? Yes, sir. Um, let's talk about July 19, 2015. Do you remember that day? Yes, sir. You were scheduled to work that day? Yes, sir. What hours were you supposed to work? Uh, 3 p.m. to 1 a.m., second shift. Do you recall that that was a Sunday? Yes, sir. Remember what kind of weather there was that day? Uh, I believe it was a typical hot summer day. Do you remember what you did before you went to work? Uh, yes, I actually took my mom out to breakfast. So what time did you go to work? Uh, I usually arrive early, about 2.30. I arrive in plain clothes to work because my uniform and my equipment is in my locker at UC Police Department. So I arrive early to change into my police uniform. And what's the first thing you did that day uh, after changing into your uniform? We, it's referred to as briefing. At the beginning of your shift, you'll go in with other officers that work second shift, and your second shift lieutenant or sergeant will sit everyone down and address whatever business is occurring that day, just so you're all up to date on what's going on. Do you remember anything specifically about what was addressed at the briefing? No, okay. sir. It was nothing. Was it called roll call? You can refer to it as roll call, yes. And there wasn't anything specific talked about? Nothing out of the ordinary, no, sir. Okay. Um, you were assigned a beat, correct? Yes, sir. Did you run the same beat every time you went to work, or did those rotate? No, sir. Every day you were assigned a new beat um, by sergeant or lieutenant. Do you remember what beat you were assigned to run on July 19, 2015? Yes, sir. What was that? It's, it's called 9233 beat. It's an off-campus. I was completely off UC's campus to the south of the campus out in the city of Cincinnati, solo in a patrol car. Okay. And is it correct that you see officers all the time at that point were running beats off campus and patrolling off campus? Yes, sir. We had more off-campus patrol beats than on-campus patrol beats. Why was that? Uh, again, to address the crime issue at, at the time, um, our chief, Jason Goodrich, he, he was a very big proponent of proactive traffic stops, being out in the community, being visible. And since we had a mutual aid agreement with the city of Cincinnati, we had police powers and jurisdiction out in the surrounding areas of Clifton around UC's campus, and actually the, the whole city for that matter. But we just stayed within close proximity to UC's campus. And were you under any specific orders to write so many tickets per shift or anything like that? There wasn't a quota system, but he was a big proponent of 
I want to see traffic stops, I want to see proactive activity, I want to see you visible out there, and if there's a violation, I want you to pull that car over. Did you ever pull cars over just because you didn't like the color of the car or because you felt like it? No, sir. When did you pull cars over? Only for a legitimate, lawful reason. Okay. Um, you mentioned you were a solo car. What did you mean by that? Uh, sometimes you can have a partner ride with you. That's a, that might be referred to as a two-man unit. Um, but our normal assignment for that 9233 beat was for you to ride by yourself in a car. And we are here today because of your involvement with Sam DeBose, which occurred about 6.30 on July 19th, correct? Yes, sir. Were you involved in any traffic stops prior to your encounter with Mr. DeBose? Yes, sir. Jeff, may I approach you with this, please? Ray, I'm going to hand you what's been marked Exhibit 3, Defendant's Exhibit 3, and ask you if you can identify that, please. It's a uh, copy of my body cam videos from previous traffic stops on July 19th. And are those all the traffic stops you were involved in on July 19th? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Judge, may I display this to the jury? I'd like to have it admitted at this point. Okay. Ray, do you recognize that? Uh, I'd have to watch a couple more minutes, maybe. Not yet, no. Officer Derek Nolan, also with UC Police, he had conducted a traffic stop and I was providing backup for him on his mm -hmm. traffic stop.
233 traffic stop, East McMillan and Auburn. <laughs> Campus. And 
you remember why you initiated that stop? Uh, I believe when the vehicle had passed me near the Shell gas station on McMillan, uh, there was no front license plate on the vehicle, and the registered owner had came back under a driving suspension. And also in the back seat, I'd seen young kids kind of moving around that looked like they were unbuckled. When you say unbuckled, you mean not in car seats or seat belts? Correct. Hey, sir, I'm going out to the UT police. Do you have a license on you? Is this your car? Okay. The reason I'm talking to you, you have a front plate on your dashboard somewhere. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's why I'm in front of the car, man. Then I saw your kids in the back, and they're trying to... I got my idea on my bike. What's your license that? What's up with your license? Okay, are these all your kids in the back seat? Okay, is anybody under four years old? Okay, what happened there? Uh, the, the front plate is in the, the, uh, the dashboard area, which it's supposed to go on the front of the car, and then the driver uh, did not have a valid driver's license. He presented you with what? Uh, I believe it was a State of Ohio ID card. Do you know how one obtains one of those? Yes, sir. When your driver's license is revoked or you don't have one, you can be issued a state ID. And <coughs> by the very nature of him giving me the state ID, I knew at that point that he was not a valid licensed driver. I thought I heard him in there tell you that he was suspended. Yes, sir, in addition to that. Okay. Um, go ahead. What's that? Okay. If they're under four years old, they're under 40 pounds, they have to be in a car seat and a booster. And you have four kids in the back seat, and there's only three seat belts. So. Uh, this is the only car we got. My wife's car is actually. Okay. Keep it straight. Can you shut your car off for me? And can you hand me the key? Is this your wife with you, I'm assuming? Okay. Does she have a valid driving license? You asked the driver of that vehicle to turn the car off and hand you the keys, correct? Yes, sir. Why did you do that? Uh, to prevent him from driving off at that point. And he had in the car with him his wife and four kids in the back seat? Yes, sir. No? Okay. So, right, man, I'm just going to detain you right now. That does not mean you're going to jail or anything. You can just set your stuff down. Does the interlace, hold on, hold on. The interlace your finger to top of your head for me. And go ahead and face your wife, like in your seat. Just kind of slide closer. And give me your left hand. Like I said, man, you're just been saying, okay? If everything got smooth, you get a ticket me on your way, all right? Hey, give me your right hand behind your back. All right, now I can step out. Let's get back. Why did you handcuff that individual and have him out of the car? Uh, driving under suspension is an arrestable offense. It's the highest misdemeanor. Um, and can be taken to jail for it, but you can also be cited for it at officer discretion. In addition, since we're on a busy road like McMillan, since he doesn't have a driver's license, I'm gonna have to talk to him more about those issues, and it's easier and safer to do it when he's back at my police car to talk to him instead of standing on the side of the road where cars are going behind you. And the, the handcuffing is for your safety? Yes, sir. I could hear a call back here, so we're out of traffic. Oh, Justin here in one second. So what's up with your license, man? I had a car, man, and uh... Yeah? I had a seat, and they sent me something from Columbus. Telling me to uh, show proof of my ownership, or proof of uh, insurance, but I no longer have it for it. And I don't know if my license are suspended or if they just, if they took me or what, I don't know what it is, but it's, been over a year. Well, obviously, you only had an ID card. Uh, at some point, it was What were you doing with his handcuffs right 
When I initially put the cuffs on him, he had said that they were too tight, they were hurting his wrists, so I was readjusting his handcuffs to make them as comfortable as possible. And confiscated, you know, whatever. Well, like I said, man, if everything's good, good, everything's cool, we'll get you on your way here with the ticket, okay? Nothing legal on you, right? Any warrants or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got a ticket for that before? Yeah. And my complete. Yeah, I just told him. How many? How many do you think you have? very difficult to hear. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that conversation there was about? Yes, sir. I, I asked him if he had any warrants for his arrest, and he said he did. And what, what do you mean by warrant? Uh, if you're issued a ticket uh, or something of that nature, and you don't show up to court or don't pay your fine, the court will issue a warrant for your arrest. And did you ultimately determine how many warrants he had? He had five warrants for his arrest. And for what? What, you know? I believe they were all for just various traffic offenses. Okay. Bring on, please. Can you throw the feet out for me, man? Bye. Can you lift your hands up for a second? You nothing on you, right? Yeah. Okay, so on a video tape up? And okay, so on the go. Alright, well, let's get back to my car. Thank you for back for me, okay? Here in a second, I'm going to What did you just say to him? Since it was a hot day out, I told him I would turn up the air conditioning in my police car so he's more comfortable. Okay. And when an individual has five warrants and is driving under suspension, what option, what, what would you do with them? What are your options? Uh, you can either take him to jail for the warrants and the license offense, or you can choose to recite him and give him a new court date and a traffic citation for his license offenses and send him on his way. And how do you determine what you're going to do? It's it's all officer discretion. You check with a supervisor? Uh, yes, you can check with a supervisor, but it depends on how a multitude of things, how cooperative he's being and, and everything of that nature, how many warrants he has, the nature of his warrants, things like that. Do you have your ID on you? Are you aware of that too, as far as your, your kids go? With car seats? What do you mean, come on? Well, if, if any of them are under 4 years old or under 40 pounds, they have to have a car seat. They have to be in one. And you have what, 1, 2, 3, 4, you have 4 kids in the back and only 3 seat back. So, I just know that you guys are going to crash and one of them, you know, it becomes a, a missile. Okay. Do you have any warrants or anything? No. Okay. Give me a second. Same fight. Um, obviously, he's not allowed to drive. We'll see what do we can do about You know, if you can call somebody here to get a ride, um, then we'll go from there. So we'll have to carry a car. There's one of the other he's got to have a warrant, so that's take care of. And he's got to have a ticket, so he never took care what is, what is going on here? Uh, the the female passenger does not have a valid driver's license either, so I'm advised. That's the state ID that she presented to you. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm I'm telling her that if we can work something out where a licensed driver can come to the scene and pick up their car, I don't have to tow it. 
to save them hassle, fees, and all that with towing expenses. What is the policy at the UC Police Department when you encounter a, a driver who has no valid license? Uh, you can either tow the car, you do check with your supervisor, but you have discretion to tow the car or to release it to a licensed driver. Are you ever permitted to let whoever is there with the car to drive it to a parking lot or drive it home? Yeah, if they don't have a valid license, we're not allowed to let an unlicensed driver take control of the car. Let me know if you figure it out. We'll try to get you guys in the right here, okay? Actually, do you guys want to turn the car back on to the AC? I know it's hot out. There you go. I'm going to have that up here, Again, since it was hot out, I gave the keys back to the passenger to turn the air conditioning on so the car wasn't too hot for them to sit inside while they're waiting. Did you know it was going to be a while? It was going to be a couple minutes, yes. Everybody's going to stop this one. on the top left it was at uh, about 4.30 in the afternoon. You had lost for that. <laughs> Just a repeat of everything. Well, I understand that man and I understand it's, it's hard to not drive. supervisor about his warrants and getting his basically opinion of what I should do with the driver as far as taking him to jail or giving him a, a new court date. What was the 2015 and the ABC and that sort of That plays a role into whether we recite or not. Uh, if their warrants are very old, we may be more inclined to take them to jail because they haven't taken care of their warrants. If their warrants are, are newer, such as his, I believe, were May of 2015, we may be more inclined to give them a recite because it was so recent. Uh, okay, 
driver um, about getting another licensed driver to respond to the scene to pick up this car so I would not have to tell it. And were you telling him that you were going to recite him rather than take him to the justice center? Yes, sir. And what does that mean? I'm going to give him a new court date and not take him to jail for his traffic warrants. What's that? Are you talking to me? Oh, okay, good deal. All right, man. He's going to be resided on this warrant, and he's just going to get a couple of tickets. Um, now, to avoid that in the car, is there somebody close I can get here? Yeah, All right, good deal. Where's she coming from? What's up, guys? Okay. Is that pretty fun? Is she coming by herself or with somebody else? No. Alright, okay, so she's just going to park somewhere and, and drive this car then? Or? and a, a new court date, yes. Okay, and when that was completed, what happened? Uh, I released the driver, and a licensed driver came to the scene and, and picked up the car, and I sent everyone on their way. Okay, can we skip forward? Uh, three quarters away from You're still writing citations here? insurance on your car. You're going to get a warning on um, that front license plate being in the windshield. That's just got to go in the front of the car. Okay. Uh, the brakes you're getting, since you were pretty cool with me, are the license plate, your car's like any says, and you're not going to jail. Okay. If you were not popular with me, you wouldn't be going to jail for your warrants and these. Okay. So this is going to be a mandatory court appearance on August 6th, that's a Thursday, 1 p.m., room B at the Justice Center downtown. Same thing with your warrant. Your new court date for that is also August 6th, same date and time, same room. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. All right.
you step up to my head up here. There's a pocket there, and I keep a handcuff key right there, so I probably hit my body cam. Uh, this on your recite. And on the top, this right here. Alright, so on the fifth, one PM room B. Oh, yeah, let me this here in a second. Make sure you check them, man. You don't, if you don't say that, you don't wear it, then you'll probably get the other next time. Alright. Make sure you don't drive until you get the stuff taken care of, okay? Insurance and your license. Man, do you know you guys from the United address? That's on Baker? Twenty-seven, twenty-one Baker. All right, you're good. I need to check the license. All right, you guys have a better day, okay? He's got it. All right. This was a, another traffic stop I conducted. Uh, again, there was no front license plate on the vehicle, and after running the rear tag of the vehicle, that registered owner was also under license suspensions. And that's the same thing that happened with the traffic stop we just saw? Yes, sir. It's the same thing that happened with the traffic stop with Sam DeBose, right? Yes, sir. The problem with the front license plate, the registered owner of the vehicle is under suspension. Objection. Yes, sir. It is leading judge. Where did this stop occur, Ray? Uh, this was in Bellevue Park, which is a park in my patrol area south of UC's campus. And would it be fair to say, I'm not trying to leave, that that is to the west of Vine Street? Yes. This is at what time? This is approximately 6 p.m. on July 19th. Good. 
driving the car at this point is not the registered owner of the vehicle and she gave me a valid driver's license. Did you know it was valid when she gave it to you? Actually I didn't know it was valid when she gave it to me. She just gave me a driver's license which I'm now checking to see if she is valid. Officer Alan Van Pelt from UC Police, he was backing me up. On the traffic stop. Did you ask him to back you up? No, sir. He just showed up? Yes, sir. And that's because he heard the traffic stop on the radio, correct? Uh, yes. So would I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to keep your eye on the make sure that plate just got you on the front, okay? Otherwise, I'll give you a warning on it, but, uh... All right, you got a good night, okay? What did she say to you? You want to get 645? She said, you too, officer. She said you're getting a snap. What was that last part about? I think we were talking about going to dinner at some point. You and Officer Van Pelt? Yeah, later on in the evening. Okay, what happened? Okay, so we're finished with that. Okay, Ray, that traffic stop lasted how long? Uh, approximately three, four, five minutes, maybe. What happened after that? After the traffic stop? Yes. Uh, I just continued about my patrol duties. Okay. Um, and the next stop, or the next time we see your body camera in operation is when you were at East Hollister and Vine Street, correct? Yes, sir. And that was about 631? Yes, sir. And that's when you came into contact with Sam the Bose, correct? Yes, sir. What were you doing at East Hollister and Vine Street? Uh, since McMillan is only a, a one-way street, you can only drive eastbound on it. I had gone down McMillan and took a right on Auburn and then another right on Hollister to come back towards my patrol area. And what happened as you were at East Hollister Vine? When I was at the intersection, I happened to look up north, up the hill on Vine Street, and I saw a green Honda Accord coming from the intersection of McMillan and Vine Street. It was, the car was coming southbound on Vine towards me. I noticed the, the car did not have a front license plate, and as the vehicle passed, 
I could not see who was driving. All I saw was one person driving with a red and white shirt and a red and white hat on. As the car passed me on Vine Street, I was able to read the rear license plate of the vehicle and I typed that into my computer in my police car. And that's what we saw in the, the photograph or the exhibit that was admitted in the state's case? Yes, sir. And what did you learn when you typed the license plate into your computer? That the registered owner, registered owner of that car was under license suspensions. And did you learn who the registered owner was? Uh, it was a, a female, and I did later on learn who the registered owner was. And that was Deshonda Reed, right? Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, since I came back with the vehicle, the registered owner being under suspension, that's when I pulled out southbound on Divine Street to conduct a traffic stop on that car. What was going to be the reason for the traffic stop? The no front license plate on the car drew my attention to the vehicle, but after running the rear plate and it coming back to the registered owner being under a driving suspension, which is a, a serious misdemeanor, that's why I pulled out to conduct the traffic stop. Is that what you were supposed to do as part of your duties with the UC Police Department? Yes, sir. So what happened? As we traveled southbound on Vine Street, I came up behind the vehicle, and as we approached Thill Street, the driver turned his left blinker on to turn on to Thill Street. As he did that, that is when I turned on my red and blue lights to conduct a traffic stop. Let me stop you there. Um, why would you, or first of all, are you familiar with that area? Yes, sir. Is that because it's close to your feet? Yes, sir. It's right on the edge of my patrol area. What do you know about that area? What did you know on July 19th? Uh, that area, there's, there's a park there called Inwood Park, right at Vine and Thill, and it's... Uh, when I noticed he turned on, or the, the driver at the time turned on to Thill Street, I thought he was going to pull over right on the Thill and we would be right out of traffic off of Vine Street because that is a very busy street. Was there any problem with that as far as you were concerned? No, sir, not at all. And what happened? As we turned on to Thill Street, I had my lights activated and the vehicle, the driver did not pull over right away. Uh, we continued driving on Thill Street and he, he wasn't accelerating away from me, he wasn't fleeing, but he wasn't slowing down. He wasn't pulling over for me at all. Let me interrupt. Were, were you in communication with your dispatcher at that point? Yes, sir. During this time, I had radioed to my dispatch that I was making a traffic stop. Did the fact that the driver did not pull over right away, did that cause any, cause you to think anything? It, it sent up a red flag to me, and that's why also on my radio I put over that he is slow to stop. What did you mean by slow to stop? That he, he wasn't, the driver was not fleeing from me, but he was just not complying. He was not pulling over right away. And we continued for two more blocks, turning onto Rice Street, where the driver finally pulled over. Did you know the driver was male or female at that point? At that time, no, I did not. So the driver pulled over around the corner from Phil on Rice, right? Yes, sir. What happened there? Uh, well, actually, during that time when he was slow to stop, I was flicking my sirens on just to make sure the driver knew that I was behind them uh, to pull over. And even after flicking my sirens on, the driver still did not pull over, just continued driving. So as, he, as the driver turned on to, um, to Rice Street, they finally pulled over against the curb. Okay, and what did you do? I exited my police car and I approached the vehicle and uh, made contact with who I now know to be uh, Mr. DeBose. And I, I introduced myself and I asked him uh, for a driver's license. And what was, 
what was happening with him? What was he doing? Uh, at that point, uh, Mr. DeBose had uh, he asked me why the reason as to why I pulled him over, and I advised him that uh, he did not have a front plate on his vehicle. You did not say anything about the registered owner being under suspension, correct? Correct. I wanted to see what his response was going to be when I asked him for his driver's license. That's why I did not tell him about the registered owner. Why did you ask for a driver's license? Uh, just to identify him, to verify that he did have a valid driver's license, and just to ID him. And what happened? Uh, well. I asked him for his driver's license, and that's when he said, he asked me why I pulled him over, and that's when he shut his car off and he took the key out of the ignition, and he reached over to the glove box on the passenger side, and he opened the glove box with the key, and he, he began to pull out uh, the front license plate to the car. Did the fact that he went into the glove box cause you any concern? A little concern. Go on, what happened next? Uh, I could see he was reaching in the glove box and he pulled out the front license plate and showed me that he did in fact have a front license plate and that's when I advised him, um, and I'm not worried about that, that just needs to go on the front of his car. And basically we can deal with that later, it's not a... And why did you, why were you not concerned anymore with the front license plate? Uh, I wanted to get back to trying to identify him and establish who he was. And did something else occur? Yeah, I, I continued to ask for his driver's license, and the way he was he was acting during this was he's being evasive. He was stalling. He would he would pat down his pockets as if he were reaching for a license or a wallet, and then he just he'd stall again. And he would ask me again, "Why did you pull me over?" And I explained to him the front license plate on the vehicle, not having one, and. At some point in there, did you observe something between his feet? Yes, sir. Uh, during, while I was talking to him, I looked down on the floorboard of his car, and there was a bottle in between his legs on the floorboard. And I asked him what that was, and he actually bent down and picked it up, and he gave it to me. And it was a bottle labeled Jim. And he advised at that point that it was air freshener. Does that mean anything to you? When I initially saw the bottle, I thought possibly with the way he's acting, being very evasive, possibly a DUI situation if he was drinking. But when he showed me the, or when he told me that the contents were air freshener, that kind of piqued my interest more that why would someone have air freshener in a gin bottle? And maybe they were asking. Any, ever had any experience with something like that before? With my experience, that would be someone who's trying to mask the odor of drugs, possibly. Okay, so what did you do? Uh, that's, I set the gin bottle on the roof, because again, I, I wasn't concerned about that. I just I was concerned with Mr. DeBose, with the way he was acting. I wanted to identify him and focus on him. Why did you put the gin bottle on the roof rather than just give it back? I just I thought that was the safest place just to put it, and I could deal with it later instead of giving an alcohol bottle potentially back to the driver. You never asked him for his keys, correct? Not at that point, no. Why not? Uh, I I was still anticipating him to give me a driver's license. I was not at the point where um, I was going to ask for his keys yet. Okay. Um, and you asked him on multiple occasions in one fashion or form or another for a driver's license. Correct. Yes, sir. And then what happened? Uh, he, he did say once or twice, he said, you can run my name or my social. Uh, but again, the way he was acting, being slow to stop, first of all, handing me a, a bottle labeled gin with air freshener, and how nervous and evasive he was, there was something else going on here. This, There's some reason he is so nervous. Um, more than just a missing front license plate. And that's when I asked him, just to be honest with me, are you under a driving suspension? And that's when he said no, he wasn't. Okay. Why didn't you accept his offer immediately to go run his name or social security? 
again, with the way he was acting, I, I didn't want to just take his word for it and write his name down and turn my back to him and walk back to my police car. I didn't know if he had any weapons in his car or if he was going to take off at that point when I walked back to my police car. So what did you do? That's when I advised him that until I can figure out who he was to go ahead and take off his seatbelt. And that's when I reached my left hand towards his driver's door to open it. What was your intention at that point? My intention was, as we saw in the previous stop, was to open the door and get his car keys right then and there and put them on the roof and then secure him in handcuffs with the same technique inside the car and get him out of the car. That didn't happen, right? No, sir. What happened? As I reached with my left hand to open the door, that's, and at some point during our conversation, he had put the key back in the car ignition. Did you see him do that? Um, yes, at some point, yes. I do recall that. You saw him actually put it in the ignition? Yes, I believe the key was in his left hand at some point and it went back to his right and he just put it back in the ignition and that was it. Okay, and then what happened? So as I go to open the car door, with his left hand, that's through the open window, he reached out and he took his car door and he pulled it back shut. And at the same time he did that, he had reached up with his right hand, he turned the car on. What did you do in response to that? I reached in with my left hand in an attempt to grab his car keys and why turn the car off. Why did you do that? I was so close to his window, I thought I had a very good chance to turn his car off and stop him from taking off right there with with it being 6.30 on a, on a Sunday evening in the summertime, going into a, a neighborhood, I thought I could stop a pursuit right there before a pursuit happened, since those are very dangerous. And so I, I reached in with my left hand to try to grab his, his car keys, and that's when just a fluid motion, he had turned the car on, and he immediately with his right hand, he went down to the, uh, he went down to the center console and shifted his car from park and just put it in the drive extremely fast and just, just mashed the accelerator into the floor at that point. I heard it described that you lunged into his car. What was that about? You, you used the term reach. I, I, I reached in. I didn't jump off my feet. I didn't dive through his... I didn't dive through his window. I just... I reached in with my left arm towards his car keys. And what happened? You say he put the car in the, to drive? He... He was so fast with that, from turning the car on to drive, and just, he just mashed the accelerator to the floor. And at that point, I thought my arm was, I thought it became trapped. I thought my arm became trapped in a steering wheel somehow because I felt my arm just, it just felt pinned, just caught. And uh, that's when my, my body kind of rotated since my arm was pulled. And uh, after being able to review the video, I, again, I, I thought my arm was tangled through the top of his steering wheel. Now I know that he took his left arm and actually grabbed or, or pinned my arm against the steering wheel. 
And I, as that happened, he just smashed the accelerator and my body was just, it had turned backwards and I began to fall backwards. I was facing his trunk and I was, I had lost my balance and I was coming backwards. As he was accelerating, and I could feel his car since the way he pulled over on the curb, that there was a, another car parked in front of him. But I could feel his car as he had punched the accelerator, turning into me. I could feel his car coming into me, and I'm falling backwards. And uh, during this time, I told him twice, stop, stop. What did you mean by that? I just wanted him to stop the car. It was moving at that point? My perception, my belief at that time was that car was moving. He was accelerating. I was telling him to stop, stop his car. I just... I wanted him to stop. And I'm continuing to fall backwards. I feel, still feel my arm blocked in that car, trapped, attached somehow. And it happened so fast and just my police training kicked in as I'm falling backwards thinking I'm, or believing I'm, I guess you can use, use a lot of different words for it. Drag, falling backwards, moving with the car. Uh, however you want to describe it. I felt my body moving with this car and falling backwards and just instinctively just reached for my gun and falling backwards. I kind of fell below the plane of this window as my, my body was rotated falling. And I remember just, I didn't want to get sucked in his car and, and ran over at that point. I, I could feel, again, his car just moving left into me. And as I'm falling below the plane of his window, all I remember seeing is I could just see his, his head. And that's just when I reached up as far as I could with my right hand and, and fired a shot. Did you know that you had hit Mr. Bose at that point? No. What happened? And his car continued accelerating up the street, and at some point my hand became free, but I was still completely falling backwards, moving with his car, and I was trying to grab with my left arm his sure to seat belt something to to hold me upright to not get sucked underneath his tires as we're going up the street and I, eventually I lost I lost grip on his seat belt and my armpit was kind of kind of over the windowsill and I had lost grip and I continued falling lower and lower and eventually my arm slipped off slipped off of his door and I, I fell off of his car. Okay, and that's all what we saw in the body camera video? And yes, sir. After he fell off the car with him? I landed on my, my back and his car, his car continued to just accelerate up the street, uh, just past me. That's when, that's when I began to, to stand up and that's, that's when I noticed Officer Kidd and, and Linda Schmidt were, were running towards me. Had you seen them before that? No, sir. Did you know they were coming? No. <clears throat> Did you ask for them to come? No, sir. So you got up, is that right? And what did you do? I got up and... And during this time, we had, or I had heard a loud crash. 
and we turn around and there's a, a slight bend in the roadway and Mr. DeBose's car at that point had disappeared around that bend and myself and the two other officers ran towards where we had heard that crash. When you got up from Rice Street, where were you with reference to where you had started next to Mr. DeBose's car? I was farther up the street and now laying more on the left hand side of the street. Did you get blown into that position when you discharged your weapon? No, sir. How did you get there? I was attached, moved, moved, displaced, whatever you want to call it. I was moved with his vehicle and fell off backwards off of his car as he was accelerating. You used the term dragged a number of times in your statement to the Cincinnati Police Division two days later. Yes, sir. Were you dragged? Uh, yes, I, I was. What's your definition of drag? Being, being moved involuntarily from one spot to another against your will. Do you know how far you were moved? How far up the road you traveled with Mr. Bose's car? My estimation was 15 to 20 feet. Do you have any idea how fast he was going? Were you able to estimate that? Uh, maybe 15 miles an hour, maybe more. And when you got up to Rice and Valencia, what happened? When we had rounded the corner, Mr. DeBose's car was, the, the vehicle was, it was screaming, it was, the accelerator was still mashed and the car was just, just revving. And that's when I told Officer Kidd to, to cover me. I, I didn't know at, at the time if Mr. DuBose had been struck or not. And I told him to cover me while I went around his car to shut the car off so it didn't keep screaming. And you did successfully shut the car off? Yes, sir. Did you know Mr. DuBose's condition at that point? I, I did look at him and he did have a, what appeared to be a wound on his head. Do you know whether he was still alive? I didn't know at that point. Did you call for a medic? We did, yes. You did, or one of the other officers? I think one of the other officers. What was your condition at that point? Uh, I was in shock. I, I was in shock and my adrenaline was going and as the adrenaline started to wear off a little bit from from my left elbow down it just it felt tingly it felt like I had pulled a tendon in my arm just my forearm was starting to hurt and also my left knee was hurting and then my lower back where my duty belt so that's was hurting did you did you get any treatment for that yes sir where I went to to University Hospital. And what, what happened to the University Hospital? They gave me they gave me pain medication and did x-rays of my arm and my my lower lower back and my knee to see if I had any broken bones. You did not, correct? No sir. Would you describe your injuries as minor? Yes sir. Um, now you, two days later, went down to the criminal investigation section, which at the time was day 24 Broadway Street, right at the line here. Yes, sir. And you gave a statement to the police. Yes, sir. And they also took some photographs of you at that point? Yes, sir. And what were those photographs of? Uh, any injuries I had sustained. At this time, I'd like to hand you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 12 and ask you if you can identify that. The copies of photos of the injuries. Have you seen those photos? Yes, sir. Judge, may I show these? That's fine. Uh, I'd like to ask number 12 to be admitted, please.
sort of the top gradient. What is that? That's a picture of my whole front side of my body. That's taken on July 21st, correct? 2015? Yes, sir. What is that supposed to be? That's, that's my left forearm on my underside. Is that a bruise there? There's a bruise and then a, a scratch. What is that? It's the same picture with a, a marker on it. Again, the, the bruise and the scratch on my forearm. It's a little contusion or bruise also on my my left knee. That's a that's another picture of my left forearm with the bruise and the scratch. Okay. Um, obviously, those are not serious injuries, correct? No, sir. Did you have those before your encounter with Sam with those on July 19, 2015? No, sir. Did you get those as a result of your encounter with him and his automobile on that day? Yes, sir. Did you receive any other medical treatment as a result of this incident? Jackson. Be approached, sir. Yeah, I mean, Investigators, Detective McGuffey, and, and Specialist Time to point out new and old damage on your uniform and your equipment? Yes, sir. And were you truthful with them when you did that? Yes, sir. Some was new, some was old? Yes, sir. And you were able to recognize the new damage? Yes, sir. When did that occur? That was on July 21st, two days after the incident. Well, I mean, when did the damage occur? Uh, during. The new damage occurred during the incident. That was not damage that was on your equipment or to your uniform prior to your encounter with Sam and those? Correct. On the various body camera videos that have been admitted of you at Rice and Valencia Street, you are heard telling, I believe, Officer Lyndon Schmidt that he dragged me. And he said, yes, I saw that. Remember that? After watching the body cam video, I, yes. Do you remember anything that was said or done at, at Rice and Valencia? I don't remember what I said when I was there. I was just in shock. I only knew that I had said those, those things after I watched my body cam. Did you and Officer Kidd and Officer Lyndon Schmidt get together and decide what you were going to say? No, oh, sir. Any 
you gave the statement to the Cincinnati Police Department investigators on July 21st, correct? Yes, sir. And you were there with a the lawyer at that time, correct? Yes, sir. You had seen the video before you went and gave that statement? I'd seen the video just a couple hours before I gave my statement. Did yes. you see in the video that you did not have your hand or arm caught in the steering wheel? I, we never, we didn't break down the video. We just, we just watched it at full speed. So no, not at the time. I, I still thought my arm was caught in the steering wheel. Is that why you told the police that? Yes, sir. Did you and your lawyer formulate a story you were going to tell before you went and met with the CIS people? No, sir. Are you telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the truth here today, Ray? I'm telling you what I experienced. What I experienced it during those seconds, yes. Was it your purpose to kill Sam DeBose on July 19, 2015? No, sir. What was your purpose? to stop the threat. Yes, sir, and that was my perception. That okay. was Just talk about what Judge, Can he finish his answer before we get to the next okay. question? Okay, okay. Um, Mr. Teeter, just let him finish and then. I thought he was finished. Okay, sorry. that's all right. That's what I was experiencing. That's, yes. And when I say perceived, do you know what something is to misperceive something? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that means you're not seeing it the way it really is. Yes, sir. Fair to say? And when sir. you perceive something, what's that mean to you? That, that is what your mind is telling your body. That's what you're living through at that moment. So what, what, when you use the word perception, my perception was this, my perception was that. Are you telling the jury that your perception might have been wrong? That you misperceived it? Or are you saying that your perception was correct and everything you said was actually happening to you? Which part did I misperceive? I don't know. I'm just saying, are you telling the jury that the incident with Mr. DuBose, did you misperceive any of that? Or is everything you said actually what happened? And I'm not talking about perception. I'm talking about what actually happened. I, I misperceived that my arm was caught in his steering wheel. Only, only after studying the body cam did I know that he had actually grabbed my or pinned my my left hand. And when Mr. Matthew said an opening statement that I submit maybe Ray's choice of the word drag was not correct. Do you agree with that? I do, but I there's a lot of terms for it. Dragging, being displaced, moved. Uh, you can use a lot of words for it. But you just told the jury that you were being dragged. Yes, sir. And then, so is what he said correct or not? He said to them a few days ago, maybe Ray's choice of the word drag was not correct. Are you saying that your choice of the word drag is correct? Yes, but you can use other words too to describe it, the same thing. When you took your uh, pilot training, did you get a class on how to testify? Uh, we did receive training on that, yes. Okay, then how to look at a jury, how to appear to be credible. Those are things that you were all taught in the classroom, fair to say? Yes, sir. And you said you became a police officer to protect and serve? Yes, sir. I, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to to go home and every, every night at the end of my shift knowing that I've made a difference, that I, I helped someone or 
I did, wanted to serve. How did you protect and serve Sam DuBose that evening, Mr. Tensing? I protected my life. Now you're trying to say that you stopped everybody for a legitimate purpose? For, uh, for traffic. traffic violations? Yes, sir. And are you saying it's a coincidence that everybody that we saw that you stopped was African American that day? It is, yes. And you don't make any type of stops based on race at all? No, sir. And you're aware of your statistics in regard to the UC police, aren't you, Mr. Tensing? Uh, yes. And you have the highest racial disparity of any UC police officer? I'm going to object, Judge. Sustained. Because that's not true. Sustained. One. Well, let me go through your statistics, OK? Yeah. Judge, and Mr. Matthews has brought out repeatedly that this has nothing to do with race, and I have statistics to the opposite. Gentlemen, come up here. Sure, Judge. Now. What was just stated by the prosecution and the question, I mean, the question that was asked. Go ahead. Judge, if you could note, I had a number of questions. If you could note my objection to all of that. Absolutely. Sure. Now, as far as um, your background, you said you went to um, Green Hills PD and then you took the Ohio State Highway Patrol exam. Yes, sir. And what did that involve? The hiring process, uh, background checks, uh, home interviews, uh, an orientation day at the patrol academy. Okay. Did you have to study for anything or take any kind of um, exam or test or anything like that? Uh, I, I don't recall taking any written tests. Okay. But it was a process, a lengthy process that you went through to become a, a trooper. Yes, sir. And that's something you really wanted? At the time, yes. And you knew troopers went statewide? I, I did. And you told the jury a few moments ago, Mr. Tessie, that at some point during the six-month training period, I think the word used was you had an epiphany that this wasn't right for you. How long did the six-month training period did you have this epiphany? The next day after I went up for training. The, the, was it the first day? The following day. So you went up there on whatever day it was, and then you slept there overnight? Yes, sir. We did training for the first day in orientation. And was the epiphany that next day, or was it the first day like before you went to bed, or when, when was the epiphany? Just, I just kind of realized it throughout the day that this, this isn't for me. So you quit after one day? After two days, but yes, I resigned and I went back to Green Hills Police Department. Let's talk about your weapon, okay? Um, how do you load that weapon, Mr. Tensing? Are you talking about the the one the, for University of Cincinnati Police? Right. I'll call it the murder weapon. How do you load that weapon? It's a, it's a handgun, and you 
How did you load it is what I'm saying that day. How did, how did you load that gun that day? I did not load the gun that day. Okay, when did you load it? Several days or weeks prior. It always stayed in my holster. I didn't take it home with me. I didn't load it and unload it every day. Did afterwards. you check it that day? Yes. Okay, tell us how you checked it. Uh, just you pull your gun out and you pull the slide back a little bit to make sure there is a round chamber. And then you pull the slide back to where its normal setting is and you put it back in your holster. Could you tell the jury why you keep one in the chamber? That's as as law enforcement officers keep one, a bullet in the chamber so you don't, when you pull your gun, you don't have to take time to load your gun in a, in a fast, stressful situation. So if you didn't put one in the chamber, you have to pull back the slide, one would come up from the magazine into the chamber, then it would be ready to fire. Yes, sir, you'd have to take your other hand and pull the, pull the slide back and then let it go and put a bullet in. And it's just a way to, to let you fire the gun faster, fair to say? Yes, sir. Okay. And as far as your training with the weapon, could you tell us about that? We at UC had to to qualify. I believe at that time it was twice a year with our our service weapon and other weapons and shoot at a uh, targets. Would you say that you're a good shot? Okay. Okay, you passed all the tests that you needed to pass. A decent shot, yes. Yes, okay. sir. And that's at a shooting range. I think Lieutenant, um, talk about that, Lieutenant Haas. Yes, sir. And let's talk about how you, how you take, how you took that weapon out of that holster, Mr. Tensing. Okay. Did you practice that? Yes, sir. And tell, tell us about how you practiced so quickly take that weapon out of that holster. Just practice with your the hand you shoot with to just draw your weapon out and you practice that repetitive so you could do it quickly when you needed it. And you try to get as fast as you could, is that fair to say? That's the idea, yes. Okay. And tell us what you have to do to take that your gun out of your holster that day. What did you have to do? There's a there's a hood on the top and you depress that and it goes forward and then you depress a button under that hood and you can pull the gun straight up. And there's some talk earlier in the trial with um, some witnesses about um, doing all that before you got to the the car, the new Bose car. Did you do any of that before you went to the car? Did I pull my gun Drop out? your hood, you know, push it down so you could get your gun out faster. No, sir. So when you pulled your gun on Mr. DuBose, you had to go through all those steps. Fair to say? Yes, sir. And that even though it was supposedly a dangerous area, there had been shootings, that didn't raise any red flags with you that evening, did it, Mr. Tensing? Because you could have dropped that hood and get your gun a little more ready to go. You, you can, yes. Right? Okay. But you didn't do any of that. No, sir. Would you agree with me that that adds time to the length it takes to get your gun out if you have to go through those steps? Yes. So just to be clear, all you have to do then when you pull the gun out is to pull the trigger? Uh, to fire it, yes. There's no safety? No, sir. There's a bullet in the chamber? Yes, sir. And would you agree that you killed... Samuel DuBose, Mr. Tensing. Yes, but I, I did it to stop the threat. You killed Sam DuBose, did it? Yes. And your index finger pulled the trigger, did it not? Yes. And you intended or meant to do that, didn't you? Yes. You had never met Sam DuBose before that evening, had you? 
No, sir. And you would agree that you purposely killed him. That all the jury has to do is figure out if it was justified or not. Objection. Sustained. Judge Cox, for the basis of that, that he pur let me ask you this: Did you purposely kill him? Which I no, sir. <coughs> Judge, that is an element we have to prove, and I think and I can answer that. You've asked, you asked him three times, and he said yes. Um, I don't think he did, Judge. He did. Did you purposely kill him? He, Judge, I object. Yeah. Purposely is a legal concept. I, I, I sustained him. Was it your intent, going through your head that time, to kill him? No, sir. It was to stop the threat. Now, when you stopped him that day, you said he was slow to stop. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. And he never sped up or tried to flee, did he? No, sir. He just did not pull over. And you walked up to the car. There was no problem. Fair to say? He didn't try to take off on you at that point. There was not a problem, but I, there was a red flag that was raised in the back sure. of my mind at the time. He answered your questions. He, he did not give me a driver's license. But he answered your questions about that you asked him. In fact, a couple times he asked you, he said, let me tell you my name, you could run. Fair to say? Sir, again, the way he was acting after handing me a bottle labeled gin, claiming it was was air freshener, being slow to stop initially, and how evasive he was acting. I didn't want to just take his name and turn my back and, and just leave him be and just walk back to my police car. Well, nobody said that you would have turned your back. I, I didn't want to leave him sitting in his car and while I was sitting in, in my car trying to check his name. I think you forgot my question. My question was, two different times did he offer to give you his name? Uh, yeah, I believe so, yes. And you didn't take that opportunity to say, sure, what's your name? No, sir. Again, the way he was acting, I wanted to focus on him and detain him first, and then we can figure out everything else after that. Sure. And then, <clears throat> would you say that you and your fellow officers back each other up a lot, Officer Tenson? For all types of calls? It looked or? like on the calls that we saw earlier that day, there was a lot you went to back up somebody, they went to back up you, there, there was a lot of you guys back each other up a lot. Fair to say? You do, but you don't always back another officer up. Sometimes they'll do a traffic stop and you won't go. But yes, we do back each other up. Because, because you told the jury this was a dangerous area and there have been shootings and then there's all kind of stuff that you, that was in your head when you got to that street. Yes, sir. But you never once waited for backup, did you, Officer Tennessee? To initiate the traffic stop? Well, you initiated the traffic stop, Mr. Dubose stopped, you're in your car, he's fully stopped. Why not wait for somebody else to, there to help you if you had this fear of that area? In my conversation with Mr. Dubose, we had hit a stalling point. I had asked him for his license and five, sorry, five or six times. And I'm not, I'm not interrupting the answer. I think he misunderstood the question. What I'm saying is prior to getting I'm, out of the car. I'm trying to answer your question, sir. I said prior to getting out of the car, though. Prior to getting out of your car, to even approach the car. On every traffic stop, you don't just call for backup right away. I get that, but you're saying that it was a dangerous area. There's been shootings. There's gangs. There's all kinds of stuff. He went up to Phil Street where he wasn't supposed to. That was one of your options. He you pulled over, you wait a minute or two, because you heard Officer Linda Schmidt and kids say that they radioed. I, I did not hear that, Matt. Is there a question in here somewhere? Yes, please ask a question. Did you hear them radio to you? No, sir. Are you disputing the fact that they did or did not? I'm not disputing that fact. I'm just saying, if they said it over the radio, that I did not hear them say that, okay. that they were responding. Would you agree that officers wear that mic or whatever it's called, walkie talkie, on their shoulder? Yes, sir. And that if they would have said that, you would have been able to hear it? 
Fair to say. No, it's not because you don't always hear all the radio traffic coming over. There's a lot of officers talking a lot on the radio. We're all on the same channel. Sure. Now, did you tell him that he was under detention? I did not directly tell him that, no. Because when you talked to the homicide detectives, when you were telling your story, you said, I advised him that I was going to detain him. Did you ever say that? It was implied because what I actually said is, until I can figure out if you have a license or not, or until I can figure out who you are, something to that effect, go ahead and take your seatbelt off. That's an implied statement I gave to them to basically detain him. But when told homicide detectives, I advised him that I was going to detain him. Did you ever do that? I did not directly tell him that, no. It was, it was so an implication. Was this a lie that you told to the homicide detectives? No, sir. It's just I implied that. <clears throat> Besides my lawyer and my, my parents, no. Nobody asked you what happened? Uh, no, not before talking to the detectives. So you're telling the jury in those two days, you never spoke to anybody about the case, your friends, your family? You said you talked to your family? I, I talked to my parents about, yes, I did. And no one asked you what happened, and you didn't tell anybody what happened? No, sir, besides the detectives. You put a blanket of silence over yourself? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I, I told my parents they were well aware of, of the incident and what happened. And my dad went with me to the attorney's office to watch the body cam, so they were aware. And you realized the stakes were high as far as whether you'd be charged or not, fair to say? I, I didn't know at the time. Well, because part of your training, they talk about what happens in police involved shootings, don't they? There's a process afterwards, isn't there? Yes. You mean an investigation? Yes. Yes, sir. And, and you knew that, didn't you, Mr. Tensing? Yes, sir. And nobody told you when you were getting interviewed how to answer the questions or what you could say to try to beat this case? No, sir. Would you say you thought about it a lot in those two days? That's all you could think I've, about, right? I've thought about this every moment for the last two years. Okay. And you had a lot of time to decide what you were going to say to the investigators and to the jury. Fair to say? There has been a lot of time, yes. And you've replayed it in your own mind, haven't you? I mean, sometimes. And you heard Sergeant Hines say that they don't show videos to witnesses and officers in officer involved shootings because it impairs the credibility of their statement. Did you hear him say that? Yes, sir. And did it impair the credibility of your statement, Mr. Tensing? Before I talked to the detectives, I did not ask to see my body cam. My lawyer showed me the body cam video. Time. Did you hear my question? Did it impair the credibility of your statement by you watching that? Because you relied on your seeing the body cam to fill in the blanks, or was it all from your own memory? It was from my own memory. We didn't get a chance to break down the video. I just watched it full speed a handful of times before we went to the detectives. Okay. Now you heard Mr. Fredericks, and he put up the slides at the time, and he took some of your statement and showed the, the slides, and when Mr. Graffin Reed asked him, when in your statement you said, in my hand and my left arm, it somehow got caught or tangled up in the steering wheel as he's accelerating, do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. And you saw the slide that Mr. Fredericks put up and said that wasn't true. Did you agree with Mr. Fredericks when he said that? I don't know what slide you're referring to. 
Well, the slide that he put up when, when Mr. Graffenried asked him, showing that your hand did not get caught or tangled up in the steering wheel. I, I still don't know what slide you're referring okay. to, sir. In the slide, he put up a series of slides, and I'm not going to put all those up. But the, sir. the statements that he made, that he said he were absolutely not in the video or not in the frame by frame. I lost my balance and fell against his car on the left side of my body. He said that was false and not shown in the frame by frame or the video. Do you agree or disagree? I agree, but he also said there was 0.4 seconds where he can't account for anything. There okay. he has no opinion of what was going on. You said I was hanging on to the side of his car and I was kind of facing backward. My body was facing his trunk. He said that was false. Do you agree or disagree with him? I disagree, and I, I mean no disrespect to Mr. Fredericks, but he was not there experiencing what I was going through. As he continued to accelerate, my arm was still stuck at this point. I could not free it. He said that was false also. Do you disagree? I don't disagree with that, but that was my perception, my belief, what, I, what was happening in those split seconds. Let's go back to that. You said perception. So is it... Are you saying you misperceived that, or that's actually what happened? Sir, I misperceived that my arm was stuck in the steering wheel. And only after, the, after being able to watch and study the body cam did I realize that I believe Mr. DeBose grabbed or pinned my left arm with his left hand against the steering wheel. Okay. So I pulled my gun out, and as I'm falling, I'm kind of below the plane of his window. He said that was false. Do you agree or disagree with him? I disagree. So the only shot I could see that I could take to stop the threat was a headshot. That's the only part of his body I could really see at that point and had a clear visual of. He said that. Do you think that's false as well? Sir, again, I mean no disrespect to Mr. Fredericks, but he watched the body cam video and analyzed the body cam. He was not in my head examining what my eyes were seeing and what I was feeling during those seconds. So you say that's false as well? I, I disagree with that. Okay. And he just continued to accelerate, and that's when I discharged one round. He said that was absolutely false. Do you disagree with him on that? I disagree. I could feel the car turning, moving into me and accelerating. Now when, after this happened, when Officer Kidd and Linda Schmidt were there, you had said you were being dragged. Did you recall what one of them said? At the time, I, I don't remember what was being said, only after I watched my body cam that sure. I knew what was said. Did you recall what one of them said to you, Officer Tensing? Officer Kidd said, yeah, I saw that. And did he say that... The response was, did he pull a gun on you? Do you recall one of the officers saying that, Mr. Tensing? Again, I, I don't recall it when this was happening, but sure. I do recall that in the, in the body cam, hearing that, yes. So the first thing one of the uniform officers said, your backup was, did he pull a gun on you? Correct? Yes, sir. Now you told the Cincinnati police that you fired a gun on duty one other time at a dog? Yes, sir, at Green Hills. And would you say that it's fair to say that you felt that dog was a danger to you or others at the time? Yes, sir. Was it a danger to you or to others? It was a danger to me. And did that dog charge you? Yes, sir. And you thought that dog was going to hurt or kill you? It was growling and barking and running towards me, yes, sir. How close was the dog to you when you fired your gun at that dog, Mr. Fencing? 10 to 15 feet. <coughs> and did you aim at that dog? Very quickly, yes. And you fired your gun? Yes, sir. And you missed? Yes, sir. But your intent was to kill that dog? It was not to kill the dog, it was to 
stop the threat that the dog posed. Would you say it's hard to hit a moving target, Mr. Tensing? It is more difficult than a stationary target, yes, sir. Is it easier to shoot and kill a human who wasn't moving, who was trapped in a car with his seatbelt on like Sam DeVos when you're only one to two feet away from his head? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Is it easier to shoot and kill a human being who wasn't moving like Sam DeVos who was trapped in a car with his seatbelt on when you're only one to two feet away from his head? There's nothing easy about the, about what happened. And the Sam DuBose shot was an easier or better shot than trying to kill that dog, wasn't it, Mr. Tennant? We were closer together, yes. So it's easier to kill him than it was to kill the dog, right? easier to stop the threat as we're closer. Now you, you heard Mr. Matthew say that you acted, he insists of a lot of witnesses, that you acted instinctively. Did you say that? Sir. And what, what does that mean when you act instinctively, Mr. Tensing? That you act very, very quickly. Without thinking? Sometimes, yes. And you really don't think, when you act instinctive, instinctively, you don't really think of the consequences. Would you agree? I, I would agree, yes. You just react without fully thinking something through. You know what the consequences can be. You do or you don't? You, you do during this action, but you know what the consequences can be. in your statement you said they asked you your statement's a homicide the question was your intention when you drew your weapon was to do what and your answer was it was to stop the threat I believed at that point when I was getting dragged by his vehicle that he was actively trying to kill me is that fair to say yes sir so the time that you drew your weapon your intent was to shoot it at the threat is that what you're saying Yes, sir. Okay. And the decision that was made to draw the weapon was way before the shot. Would you agree, Mr. Tensing? <coughs> right? It was quickly before the shot. Because you had to mess with your holster, you had to draw it out, you had to bring it up. That, that took a period of time. Agreed? Yes, sir. At the time that you went for that gun, what was in your head is you were going to shoot Mr. DuBose, or in your words, stop the threat, fair to say? What was in going through my mind in that moment is I'm already moving with this car, and my arm is stuck, and he's accelerating. Now, you said you tried to reach around the steering wheel, too. And your, your words, nobody told you to say this, were to knock the key out of the ignition. To take his key and pull it out of the ignition. But your words were knock the key out of the ignition, weren't they, Mr. Tensing? Yes, sir. Well, tell, tell me what it means to knock the key out of the ignition. How do you do that? You grab the key and turn it back to off and pull it out. But you never said that's what you were going to do. You said knock it out. I mean, nobody told you to say that word, knock it out. That's, that's your word, isn't it? Yes, sir. Have you ever knocked a key out of an ignition? Yes, sir. What I meant by that is to grab a key quickly and pull it out of the ignition. Have you ever knocked a key out of the ignition? That's what I mean when I said that, sir. Because once a key is turned on, everybody knows the ignition's on the, like the steering column and you put it in, and then you've got to turn it. Yes, sir. So if you knock it, nothing's going to happen. Fair to say? Again, what I, 
what I meant by saying that was to quickly grab the keys and turn it to the opposition and pull the keys out. But, but you never said that to anybody. You kept saying knock the key out. You said that repeatedly. That's just the wording I used, sir, to describe what my intentions were. Would you say that you forgot your training at that point? My training had said if you're going to reach into a car, do it with your non, your non gun hand. It was an instinctive reaction to reach in the car. Your training really didn't say that, did it, Mr. Tensing? It said don't reach in with your dominant hand. It never said reach in with your non dominant hand, did it? It said if you're going to reach into a car, with, don't do it with your gun hand. You wouldn't say, it would, and then a couple other times it said just never reach in a car. Do you remember the slide I put up that said never, 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 never reach in a car? Yes, sir, do you remember that? And you remember Chief Hughes telling you that? Yes, right? sir, but he, even he said that there are times when you do reach into cars. Well, I think a lot of the officers said if somebody's unconscious or dead or passed out, or maybe you reach in a car to get somebody's license that they hand you instead of making them handed outside the window. Would you agree this was the most extreme type of reaching into a car? Uh, I don't agree that it was an extreme. You don't? No, sir. When I reached in to grab the keys, I did not expect Mr. DuBose to be that fast, put it in the drive and accelerate. I thought I could grab the keys and take them out and we could, it would be stopped right there before he went anywhere. Okay. So you remember, are you telling the jury that you remember a lot of your training, but you forgot just that one thing? Sir, again, my training said if you're going to reach into a car, do it with your non-gun hand, and that's what I did. I reached in with my left hand. So you're saying you're following your training when you reached into that car? If what you're getting at, it's not advisable. I agree with that. It was an instinctive reaction. I reacted to Mr. DuBose's actions. And do you remember the, you remember the part about cuffing somebody in the car? That was part of your training. Yes, sir. You remember that? You remember to approach the car and stand in a certain place? That was part of your training, fair to say? Yes, sir, but there are a lot of different ways to do a lot of these different things. There's no absolute. Sure. You remember that part, you did that part correctly, right? Yes, sir. You just didn't follow one part, but you remember the part, the violent part, didn't you, Mr. Tensing, about stopping the threat? You had no trouble remembering that, did you? No, sir, that was in our training. So you forgot part one, but you remembered part two, right? Sir, again, my training said if you're going to reach in, do it with your non-gun hand, and that's what I did. Well, I think the training that we all showed these witnesses said do not reach in with your dominant hand, and the implication, according to some people, was that it's okay to reach in with your non-dominant hand. That's what I'm saying, yes, sir. But nobody said it's okay to reach in and try to knock out car keys, did they? Sir, again, there's no absolutes. Every situation is different. Now, you told the jury that you didn't know Sam DuBose was dead until you were at the hospital. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. When you went up to the car after, you, after the car crashed and you turned off the ignition, did you have your gun out at that point? No, sir. But you were covered at gunpoint, weren't you? Yes, sir. And that was part of a plan, you were going to be covered, you were going to turn off the car, fair to say? Yes, sir. And there was three police, you and two others? Yes, sir. Would you say that you were a lot more cautious after you shot him in the head and the car crashed than you were the first time you reached in the car, Mr. Tensing? At that point, the incident was already over, and I had just reached in to stop the car from redlining and Revving. But you were a lot more cautious that time when there were three officers and somebody was holding Mr. DuBose at gunpoint 
than you were the, when you were by yourself at the DuBose car. Because at that point, somebody was covering you. You reached in, you were careful. You were a lot more careful then than you were a few seconds earlier. Fair to say? What do you mean by more careful? Was there was no threat at that point, was there, Mr. Tensing? After he had crashed? Right. No, not at the time, no. He wasn't moving at all, was he? Not that I saw him, no. And what did you see inside that car? Mr. DeBose was laying on his right side. And, and you told the jury a few minutes ago that you saw what appeared to be a wound. But what did you mean by that, Mr. Tensing? There was some... There was some blood around his, his head area. What else did you see? I just saw blood. So you knew that you shot him in the head? I didn't know where exactly, but I knew. I, I gathered that he had been shot, yes. And you didn't know that he was dead, right? No, sir. And tell us, Mr. Tensing, why didn't you ask Sam DuBose how he was? I was in shock. That's your explanation? This happened so fast. I was just in shock at, at what it what it just happened. You didn't have trouble telling anybody how much your arm and your knee hurt, did you, Mr. Tensing? Even though you were allegedly in shock. I was making those comments and I don't remember making those comments until after I watched the body cam. I, I don't remember those minutes, no. But he's laying dead in a car and you never checked on him and asked him how he was. And you're saying you didn't even know if he was dead or not? No, sir. I believe the other officer had called for a life squad. Did you ever try to feel for a pulse at all? No, sir. Did you ever check in any way to see if there's any sign of life to him? No, sir. In fact, the focus was on you and your extremely slight and minor injuries and your comments about your justification, how you were being dragged. That's what you focused on, not the dead body of Sam DuBose. Fair to say, Mr. Tensing? But what I focused on? Sorry, again, during those minutes, I don't know what had happened. My mind was just in shock. I just, it was traumatizing and but you focused on your arm, your knee, and you being dragged, and you didn't say one word about the person you just shot in the head. About his condition, did you? No, sir. You knew he was dead at the scene, didn't you, Mr. Tensing? I did not, know. Now, these other stops you made, there were witnesses and compliance, fair to say? At the other traffic stops? Yes. yes, sir. And with Sam DuBose, it was different because he didn't exactly comply with what you wanted, and there were no witnesses, fair to say, besides you and him. Uh, I mean, not that I'm aware of now. And you heard Chief Hope testify, didn't you, Mr. Tensing? Yes, sir. And do you agree and recognize that he's an expert in the area of use of force? I, I, I would agree. And would you agree that he looked at all relevant evidence? I, I don't know what he did or didn't look at. Okay. You heard him say everything he looked at? Yes, sir. And did you hear him say that he hardly ever sides against an officer? I did hear him say that. And did you hear him say that you made a serious tactical error? That's his opinion, yes. Do you agree or disagree with that? Again, it's not advisable to reach your hand into a car, but I reacted to Mr. DeBose's actions. It was an instinctive reaction. I did not want a pursuit to take place. I thought I could stop it right then and there. Every situation's different. Could you answer my question? He said that you made a serious tactical error. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. Okay. It's not advised, but... But not a serious tactical error. 
but sir, again, he's had time and months to evaluate this and study this. I made a split second decision. And the experts can sit here and evaluate it and study the body cam and, and break it down. But they were not in my mind during these seconds. He also said in his opinion you were not being dragged in any way when you fired the shot. Agree or disagree? I mean, there was disrespect to him, but I disagree because he was not there. Okay. Did you agree or disagree with his opinion that despite your serious tactical error, you still could have disengaged and not fired the shot? I disagree with that. Again, he was not there. So you would agree that you went to your holster that day, right? During the incident? The incident. Yes, sir. You took all the, ne the steps necessary to remove your gun. Yes, sir. You pulled your gun. Yes, sir. You knew that it was loaded and one was in the chamber. Yes, sir. You knew that if you pulled the trigger, it would fire a bullet. Yes, sir. Your index finger went to the trigger. Right? Yes, sir. You pulled the trigger and meant to do it. I meant to pull the trigger, yes. You purposely aimed for his head, Sam DuBose's head. That's the only thing that I could see at that moment. Your gun was between one and two feet away from his head. Fair to say? Yes, sir. And after all that, you're telling the jury, after all those purposeful acts that you did, that you didn't mean to kill him. I meant to stop the threat. I didn't shoot to kill him. I didn't shoot to wound him. I, I shot to stop what did you his think actions. Would, sorry. What did you think would happen once you did all that? That he would just walk away? After the After you the shot shooting? him in the head, do you think he would, he would just walk away? I never thought about that. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Matthews, redirect. No redirect. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Teeter? I guess yes, not. Uh, Mr. Kenton, you may step down there. Excuse at this time.